So we'll continue our discussion on the reliability of the Bible. Now I want to actually get to the positive reasons that I believe it's rational to accept the testimony of Scripture, considerably more rational than to reject it. Now again, it does come down to faith, as all worldviews do. If you're an atheist, it all comes down to belief that there's no God. There's no proof. If you believe in the Bible and the God of the Bible, it does, there's an element of faith, but at least there's evidence for the existence of God. But evidence is very rarely proof. Uh, even scientists recognize that when you have a hypothesis, you subject it to certain tests, and if the tests come out favorable, then you elevate that hypothesis to a theory. Then you keep testing it, and only after a great deal of evidence has been processed and testing and so forth, are you willing to call it a, a scientific fact? Because it takes a lot of evidence to become finally a proof of something. But there are many evidences that are adequate to justify a rational belief in something. For example, if in a court of law, if there are, um, let's just say there was uh, three eyewitnesses who say they saw the crime occur, and they identify the criminal, and there's DNA evidence of the victim in the, criminal's, in the, in the defendant's car. You know, this starts to look very similar to proof of the man's guilt, but it still might not be. All three witnesses could be lying, and, and the DNA of the victim may be there for some totally innocuous reason. Maybe the person gave her a ride or something at some point. You, but the evidence is at least all pointing one direction. And if none of the evidence is pointing a different direction, you've got a considerable amount of evidence going one way, it's a rational thing for a jury to convict in a case like that. Now, they might do so saying, you know, there's a, maybe a tiny, tiny percent chance that I'm reading this wrong and that he's innocent, but I cannot acquit with this much evidence against. And that's how we have to be with the Bible, I think, if we're rational. We can say, you know, all the things that we can say about the Bible point in the direction of being reliable, but there may be a, you know, not everything's finally proven, of course. There are conversations between individuals in the Bible that we can't verify because we don't have any other records of those conversations. There are miracles that are one-off events. They only happen one time. They can't be duplicated for testing in the laboratory, and therefore, you know, you know, we could be wrong about those. But if all the evidence points one way, and no evidence points the other way, then it's rational to say, I think I cannot condemn the Bible when all the evidence is in favor of acquittal of its claims. And, uh, you know, if I, if I turn out to be wrong, at least I've turned out to be wrong after being as rational and responsible as I can in seeking my answers. Now, of course, I will say more than that because I believe the Bible, because of all of this evidence we're going to talk about, but I also have, you know, the Bible teaches that you can actually come into a relationship with the God that this is about. And I am fortunate to be among those who learned of this and have uh, come into that relationship so that I actually have interactive relationship with this God. But, uh, but that alone wouldn't prove the Bible to be true. If I had some kind of a, a religious experience or a spiritual experience and said, ah, that's God, so I'm going to just say whatever, whatever the book says about him is true, without evidence, I, I, I wouldn't be comfortable doing that myself. But you see, my experience with God grows naturally out of the evidentially based faith in what the Bible says. And frankly, it's confirmed in experience. That's, that's my, my own approach. Now, Let's talk about science, because we said one of the first objections people have to the Bible is it's a pre-scientific book. Well, obviously, the Bible isn't a scientific book at all. It's neither a pre-scientific or a scientific book. It doesn't address directly, as a first concern, scientific questions. That's, uh, again, if most of the book is history, history is not in the realm of science in the same sense that some things are, because you can't repeat history for experiment. Uh, Science, in its purest form, observes repeatable phenomena and subjects them to tests and repeats it and repeats it and repeats it and finally finds the results are the same. You don't do that with history. With history, you know it happened because someone said it happened. 
And uh, if, if the witness is not reliable, then you don't know if it happened or not. But there are ways that history, at least some historical things, can be confirmed and, and, uh, and, or disconfirmed. And we're going to talk about those in a moment. But let's talk about science. The Bible doesn't really talk about science. Of course, in talking about history, it touches on things that scientists might have an opinion about, like miracles. Most scientists today do not believe that miracles occur. This is because they are not scientists merely. They are also adherents to a certain worldview called scientism. Scientism is the view that nothing can be trusted if it can't be proven by science. That science is the only source of knowledge about things. Well, a person could believe that if they want to, but it's not a view that's supported by science. Science doesn't tell us that science gives all knowledge of all things. Most scientists say it doesn't. And as I said, history is in a different realm than experimental science. So is uh, psychology. It's not an exact science. You can say, well, people who have this experience usually react this way, but there's this strange thing called free will that makes it not always happen. When my wife was killed in an accident, some people came to me and said, you seem to be handling this well, but you're probably in denial because you're going to go through the five stages of grieving, you know, and the first one is denial. Looks like you're in denial right now. Then you're going to go into anger, turn outward, anger, turn inward, you know, uh, these different five stages. Well, maybe a lot of people do that. I didn't. I chose not to. Uh, this not, you know, psychology is not a science. You can observe how people often react or usually react, but there's still free will. You don't, you know, that odd ball out there might not choose to react that way. Uh, so there are lots of things that science, pure science, doesn't really have the, the, the keys to that kingdom, you know. Uh, science cannot prove to me or to anyone else whether I love my wife or whether she loves me. I might act loving and not love her. She might act loving to me and not love me. Who can know? Only she knows. A scientist can't tell. These are not things that science knows. These are things, science has its own limited realm. And the person who's, a, who, who's an adherent to the worldview of scientism has simply become reductionistic and said, only science, that's the only place that information can be had. Well, then you're going to know very few things because science can't deal with all knowledge. It deals with the natural world and not even all of the natural world. It doesn't do very well with areas of the mind, which is part of the natural world. It, it can tell you all about the brain, but there's mysteries of the mind that are not necessarily subject to the same experimental verifications in every case. Uh, so what I'm saying is I don't care if somebody says, well, I don't believe that miracles happen because science believes that they can't. No, science doesn't believe that. Certain scientists believe that. We have to realize there are scientists who believe in miracles. There are scientists who believe the Bible's true. There are scientists who believe Hinduism is true. There are scientists who are Buddhists. There are scientists who are atheists. There's all, a, a world view is not something that all scientists will share because a world view is not subject to scientific test. A world view is the presuppositions you have in your head through which you look at everything. So that, let's just say, an evolutionist and a creationist look at the same evidence. Well, an evolutionist could say, well, this evidence points to, uh, you know, descent from a common ancestor. A creationist says, no, this evidence tells us how God created these various things. Uh, and, you know, one has one worldview, one has another. No one can go back, go back and watch it happen. So science can't prove one thing or another. They can actually look at existing data and tell whether it seems to fit best into one paradigm or another. If you have a, a creationist model, which is a worldview, or uh, an evolutionary model, another worldview, well, you can say, okay, this evidence fits better into the evolutionary worldview uh, model or better into the creationist model. But no one knows without going back there or without talking to someone who was there what really happened because we are imposing our worldview on our testing of the data. Now, the suggestion that miracles don't occur is simply something that a very tiny minority of human beings have ever believed because almost all societies have believed that supernatural things happen in one way or another, whether they believe in God or not. I mean, uh, there's hardly been a society ever that didn't believe in the demonic. Now, our modern scientific age says there are no demons. That's just psychological, psychiatric problems people have. Well, that's one theory. 
it happens to be a minority theory when you consider the experience of most of mankind. Most of mankind believe there are demons, and, and they believe that people have been cured through exorcism. I've seen it myself. But a modern scientific mind who says, well, miracles don't happen, say there are no demons. There's no demon possession. This is just the way people mistake you know, psychosis, schizophrenia. I say, well, it's interesting that you could cast schizophrenia out of a man into a herd of swine. I've never heard of any scientific explanation how that works out. But, of course, the scientists just, well, that never really happened, you know. But there are witnesses, several, who say it did happen. So what does the scientist say? We can't believe the witnesses. Why? Because they don't agree with my worldview. Well, how do you know your worldview is true? You don't. It's your starting assumption. Your starting assumption is that which you consider to be given before you start looking at evidence, and you interpret the evidence through the worldview. No one can prove their worldview, but we can say some worldviews accommodate all the evidence better than others. For example, uh, the Bible suggests a supernaturalist worldview. That is to say that nature isn't all there is. There's also a realm above nature, transcendent to nature, the supernatural realm. In that realm, there's such things as God and demons and even human <clears throat> spirits and human souls. These things are not allowed in a naturalistic worldview. And in, it's the naturalistic worldview and only that worldview that would rule out miracles a priori. But again, those who, those who take that worldview are in a tiny, tiny minority of thinking people throughout history. They're not even in the majority of thinking people in modern times, much less if you take intelligent people throughout history. And it turns out that miracles fit very neatly into a worldview that allows the supernatural. And any worldview that simply says, I don't care what you saw, I don't care how many people saw it, I don't care what you think the evidence is for it, it doesn't fit my worldview, so I can't accept it. Well, that person is speaking strictly out of, out of bigotry. They've decided on a worldview without evidence for it and decided that nothing else can be real except what fits into it. And this is not a, a rational way to reject the Bible, if, if one rejects the Bible because of its presence of miracles. You know, it's interesting that science, modern science, grew up not in the Hindu world or the Buddhist world. By the way, the Buddhist world is an atheist world because Buddha was an atheist. Uh, it didn't grow up in the pagan world. It grew up in the Christian world, in Christian Europe. And, and many uh, philosophers of science, Christian and non-Christian, have admitted that it was the Judeo-Christian worldview that encouraged scientific discovery. Because the Hindu worldview, for example, which is the other major worldview in the world at the time, was that there's no reality. All is maya. Maya means illusion. Nothing is, there are no regular laws. There are no regular recurring events. Uh, it's all circular. History is circular, not linear. That's the, that, that's the non-biblical worldview that existed before uh, modern atheism came along. Well, it was because Europe happened to believe there was a god happened to believe that he built laws into the universe and that natural laws were somewhat predictable and could be discovered, that science began and flourished. One thing I can say is that the arriving and the arising of modern science in the Christian world with, frankly, most of the discoverers of modern scientific theories were actually believers in the Bible um, in the early days. Certainly Newton, Galileo, and... Uh, you know, Kepler and many other you know, leaders in the scientific realm whose theories we you know, have greatly benefited from and certainly see as valid. They were believers in the Bible, and that doesn't prove the Bible's true, but it certainly proves that belief in the Bible does not hinder scientific discovery. You see, some people say, well, if we allow uh, you know, biblical creation to be taught in the public schools alongside evolution, that'll set back the progress of, of education you know, 150 years. I think, well, that's an interesting thing, that you think if both are presented side by side, that people are going to go with the religious view. I wonder why. Well, if you've ever seen the evidence for creationism presented side by side in a debate with evolution, you'll know why. You'll know why. Because they know that if both sides are presented side by side, it will not go well for the evolutionary view. But let's just say it did. Let's just say they did present that, and, and people did go back to believe in creation. So that's going to set science back? How so? What is it in modern science that depends on atheism? What is it in modern science that depends on evolution? I mean, 
I, I debated an evolutionist in Corvallis, Oregon, and he said, you know, if we, if we don't believe in evolution, we'd never make all these advances in modern medicine. I thought, excuse me? Which advance in modern medicine can you name that had anything to do with the discoverer believing in evolution? Creationist scientists and evolutionary scientists can both make the same progress in medicine because it doesn't matter. Evolution is a theory about the past. It's not what we find. It doesn't happen in the laboratory. Uh, a person who believes in creation, a person who believes in evolution, it doesn't inhibit science either way. Science advanced in the world in places where the Bible was firmly believed at the time. And therefore, belief in the Bible doesn't seem to be, a, you know, place a society at disadvantage for making scientific progress. Now, miracles, which defy scientific explanation, as I said, simply are something the Bible says occurs. The Bible's not alone in that. Virtually every culture in the world throughout history has believed that supernatural things occur, and the Bible's not unique in that respect. But what is unique is there's a very small percentage of human beings that have decided that they can't occur. But they've not decided on the basis of proof. How do you, how do you prove that miracles don't occur? Now, someone said, I, you know, some tests were done where a bunch of patients who were terminally ill, one group was a study group where people prayed for them to be well, and the other group was a control group where no one prayed for them. And no, no group fared better than the other. So the ones who were prayed for didn't get better any more than the ones who didn't get prayed for. So the Bible didn't say they would. The Bible doesn't say that we, we can manufacture miracles by praying for them. God's not obligated to give us miracles just because we'd like to have them or because we ask for them. The Bible indicates that God answers prayers if they're according to his will. And the Bible says it's not always his will to heal people. In fact, in the Bible, miracles are a rare occurrence, as they are in modern times. I don't know if any of you can say you've actually seen a miracle. It's possible you have. For example, I saw a woman who had four, stage four cancer, uh, and I knew her, a young woman, and she was uh, supposed to die on a certain day, but she, her husband took her to the hospital that day, and she was totally cancer-free. Lots of people have been praying for her. Okay, I, I could say that could happen accidentally. It's just a coincidence that people were praying for her. Could be. But at least I could say I've seen things that look like they could be miracles. But even if I had not, that wouldn't prove the Bible wrong when it talks about certain miracles in the past, because the Bible doesn't indicate that I should see miracles every day or that anyone ever did every day. There were miracles in the time of Moses, 1,400 years before Christ. And then the next batch of miracles happened 700 years later in the time of Elijah and Elisha, 700 BC. And then the next batch happened in the lives of Jesus and the apostles 700 years later. So there's three, in the Bible, there's three epics, short periods of time where a lot of miracles occur. And there's 700 years between them. Now, if, I, if, if a scientist I meet says, I've never seen a miracle, I think maybe you're living in that 700 year period or longer, where maybe they're not happening much. I, the Bible doesn't tell me to expect them to happen much. Miracles are the exception. God made laws of nature, and most of the time, he lets them run their course, it would appear, including allowing people to die of disease. They're going to die some way or another. You see, uh, my wife was killed in an accident. If she had died of cancer, what difference would it make to me? Oh, except she didn't suffer much in the accident. That's fortunate. But I mean, she's dead anyway. If I had died with her, what would that make a difference? I'm going to die someday. What, what day is a good day to die? You know, everyone's going to die someday. They're going to die of something. Something's going to get you. And if, if it's God's will for you to die of this sickness or of this accident or of this criminal violence or in this war or in a terrorist attack, I mean, if, in a, you know, you're going to die one way or another. And to say, well, these people prayed that these people get well and they didn't get well. So what? It's, it's you... To, you can't test if God's really there or if he works miracles by whether he works a particular miracle you're trying to experiment with. That's not how God works. God's not subject to our whims, and he does miracles relatively rarely, and he does it when he wants to. And so that's a very untestable thing. Let me read something Clark Pinnock said. He's, he's, he's dead now, but he was a great uh, Bible scholar. I had the pleasure of meeting him just before he died. I was, he's kind of been a lifelong hero of mine. He wrote this, the pervasive presence of miracles in the Bible 
offends the existential and naturalistic mood of our day. Despite the offense, however, miracles fit neatly into the worldview of biblical theism, where they function as a part of the total discourse of God. Empirical science cannot contest the validity of a miracle for the simple reason the event cannot be repeated for experiment today. The evidence for a miracle, as for any historical event, is the testimony of those who witnessed it. On that ground, the resurrection of Jesus is a very well-attested miracle, unquote. And that is, of course, true. Many witnesses claimed that it happened. They saw his body. They touched him after he rose. And uh, actually, none of the explanations given by unbelievers that are alternative explanations for the actual data that exists and is known, none of them make sense. Uh, they all have fatal flaws. The doctrine, of, uh, the idea that Jesus rose from the dead and was seen, there's no particular flaws in that except if someone has a prejudice that says God can't raise people from the dead or there is no God to do that or miracles just don't happen. But whoever says that, they're going against the testimony of hundreds of witnesses and they themselves have no evidence for what they're saying. That's not a scientific position if you have no evidence for what you're saying. It's a th it's a theory of yours. It's a prejudice. You see, actually, the atheist is the narrow-minded person because they say, I will not consider any worldview outside my own. You see, the Christian can be broad-minded. They can say, okay, someone claimed there was a miracle here. Maybe there was, maybe there wasn't. Even the Catholic Church that I don't, I don't support, you know, they, when they hear there's been a miracle... They send out a team of investigators to see if it's true or not. And they sometimes decide there was, and sometimes they decide there wasn't. But at least they can be more scientific than an atheist can, because an atheist just has to say, oh, they don't happen, so it didn't happen. At least a theist or a person who believes in the supernatural can be open-minded and say, well, I guess I'll let the evidence tell me whether it happened or not, not my prejudices. The atheist is allowing his prejudices to tell him whether a miracle happened or not a theist can decide on a much more rational basis and a much more open-minded basis. I don't believe in every miracle story I hear. I hear a lot of them. In fact, I doubt lots of them. But when they come from reliable witnesses and many witnesses, I don't see a sufficient reason to doubt them. That's my approach. Now, what about the historical narrative? I said that most of the Bible is historical narrative. You can't confirm many things that are in historical narrative, no matter what historical narrative you're looking at, the Bible or any other. But you can confirm many. And the idea that the Bible is strictly mythical or legendary or so forth simply has been ruled out by archaeological research and other historical research, of which a person who doesn't look into these things may not realize how many thousands of researchers there are who spend their whole lives looking into these things, into the archaeological evidence and such. It's a very well-studied field for the past 200 years. And um, basically, where the Bible says that something happened in a certain place and so-and-so was the king at the time and it was this year and so forth that it happened, where archaeology finds any information, it always confirms the Bible. Now, they can't confirm everything again. You haven't found all the rocks that were ever buried in the sand. But they find a lot of them, thousands of them, actually. And uh, let me just read a summary of what the leading archaeologists in the world say on this subject. And these are not Christians. I'm not quoting Christian archaeologists. This is Nelson Gleck, who is the most renowned Jewish archaeologist in the world. He said, quote, It may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or in exact detail historical statements in the Bible, unquote. Now, this is not a Bible believer. This is an archaeologist, the leading Jewish archaeologist in the world. He says, you'll never find anything that has been discovered in archaeology that would contradict the Bible, and a whole lot of things the Bible affirms have been confirmed by what archaeologists have dug up. And that is, of course, true. One needs only do a minimal amount, or a lot, if they want, of research into this, and they'll find it to be universally so. William F. Albright, Professor Emeritus of Johns Hopkins University, was considered the greatest archaeologist uh, of uh, Palestine. And he said, there can be no doubt that archaeology has confirmed the substantial historicity of the Old Testament tradition. 
historicity means the historical accuracy. He said, he didn't say, I think. He said, there can be no doubt. He's saying that nobody who's aware of things, and he's one of the leaders in the field, nobody who's knowledgeable can doubt, there can be no doubt, that archaeology has confirmed the basic historical outlines of what the biblical stories say. Why do they say that? Well, they say that because the characters in the Bible aren't just some kind of mythical characters like in the Iliad and the Odyssey. These are people living in specific places in the world at specific times where specific rulers are known to have existed, and they actually interact with them. The Jews go into captivity under Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon falls under Belshazzar. And, and there are a whole lot of rulers known from archaeology in those areas at those times that the Bible characters actually interact with. At the very least, if this is mythology or legendary, it's unique because no other legends or myths actually connect with history at so many points as the biblical stories do. And by the way, we have today the phenomenon called the historical novel, where somebody does a lot of research about history and writes a fictional story about somebody who lived at the time of Abraham Lincoln or something, and they connect a lot of things to history. That's an ultra-modern phenomenon. Ancient societies had no concept of a historical novel. They had mythology, and they had historical writings. They didn't have, you know, historically researched novels. We do. But that's, anyone who thinks that's what the Bible is, is simply anachronistic. They don't really know anything about ancient writings. That simply is an unknown phenomenon back then. Um, Miller Burroughs, who's not a Christian, but was a Yale archaeologist, he wrote this, quote, On the whole, archaeological work has unquestionably strengthened confidence in the reliability of the scriptural record. More than one archaeologist has found his respect for the Bible increased by the experience of excavation in Palestine. Now he's saying there's a lot of archaeologists who didn't particularly respect the Bible as historical, but after spending time doing archaeology in Palestine, they came out with a lot more respect for the Bible than they had before. And there's good reason, because the Bible is always either verified or at least never contradicted. Now, sometimes the archaeologists have not been able to find things and have thought the Bible was wrong briefly until they found the things. Until 1853, skeptics who did not believe the Bible thought that the last king in Babylon was Nabonidus, that he was the king in Babylon when it fell to the Medes and the Persians. Now the Bible says in Daniel 5 that the last king in Babylon was Belshazzar. The problem is that until 1853, no one had ever heard of Belshazzar his name is only found in Daniel chapter 5 in the Bible as a contemporary with Daniel, who Daniel spoke with. And no secular historian, no archaeological find supported the notion that Belshazzar was the last king in Babylon. So the Bible was assumed to be wrong. Instead, they said Nabonidus, uh, Herodotus and Thucydides, the, other, the ancient Greek historians, they said the last king in Babylon was Nabonidus. And they wrote 400 years before Christ, so they're not so far removed from the situation. So skeptics simply thought Daniel was, you know, fictional until 1853. And then they found an inscription in Babylon in a temple to a Babylonian god. And it had this inscribed in it, quote, May I, Nabonidus, king of Babylon, not sin against thee, and may reverence for thee dwell in the heart of Belshazzar, my firstborn favorite son, unquote. Now this is the first time, 1853, the first time since Daniel was written, 600 years before Christ, that the name Belshazzar was mentioned. Only Daniel remembered Belshazzar. Herodotus did not. Thucydides did not. Archaeologists had not discovered any confirmation. They said only Nabonidus was known. Well, now we have Nabonidus an inscription he made mentioning his son, Belshazzar. Now, they've learned more since then, of course, since 1853. It turns out Nabonidus was in retirement in Arabia when Babylon fell. He'd left the kingdom in the hands of his son, Belshazzar, who was second king. An interesting thing is that the Bible doesn't give us that particular detail about Nabonidus, but it does say something interesting. When Belshazzar wanted someone to read the writing on the wall and interpret it for him, he says, whoever can do that, I'll make him third ruler in the kingdom. Now, the Bible doesn't say why he would say third ruler, because the Bible hasn't told us anything about Nabonidus. It just doesn't mention him. 
turns out Belshazzar himself was the only the second ruler, so he couldn't give away a position any higher than third in control. But this is the way that the Bible artlessly is confirmed by archaeology. It happens, happens, frankly, very often. For example, Tiglath-Pileser is the king of Assyria mentioned in 2 Kings 15.29. He's the one who conquered the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC, a very significant Assyrian king. For a long time, skeptics said he never existed because they couldn't find any uh, reference to him in other historical works. However, <laughs> just in the last generation, uh, Tiglath-Pileser's capital city was excavated, and his name was found pressed into clay tablets, reading, quote, I, Tiglath-Pileser, king of the west lands, king of the earth, whose kingdom extends to the far sea, dot, dot, dot. So the Bible knew about Tiglath-Pileser. No one else did until about a generation ago when they found his name inscribed something he wrote about himself. Another case like this is Sargon II. In Isaiah chapter 20 and verse 1, it says that uh, King Sarg uh, Sargon, king of Assyria, sent Tartan to, and fought against Ashdod and took it. The only reference in the Bible to Sargon II, and he was not known from any other ancient records until he was. Again, before they find proof of him, they're always saying, oh, see, the Bible's wrong again. They say there's this guy named tiglath Pileser. They say there's this guy named Belshazzar. They say there's this guy, Sargon II. But he never existed. We have no confirmation until they do. And they do. Um, in 1842, an archaeologist named Bota discovered the ruins of Sargon's palace in Khorzabad in the north edge of Nineveh with treasures and inscriptions showing him to have been one of Assyria's greatest kings. Yet his name had disappeared from history save this lone mention in Isaiah until Bada's discovery in 1842. So again, the 1900s were especially a time of, uh, it's interesting how many errors were coming into Christianity in the middle 1800s. Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian science, and then, and then the rise of also Freudianism and Marxism and Darwinism all came up at around the same time. And that's when Archaeologists also began to find, as if God was counterattacking, the proofs for things in the Bible that the skeptics had always said weren't true. So at least we can say this. We can't prove from these incidental things that the Bible is entirely true, but we can say that every time the skeptics have said it wasn't true, our further discovery did not confirm the skeptics, but actually confirm the Bible. So the Bible has a track record for being right. The skeptics have a track record for being arrogantly wrong. Sir Frederick Kenyon, who is the former director of the British Museum, in his book, The Bible and Archaeology, he wrote, quote, archaeology has not yet said its last word, but the results already achieved confirm what faith would suggest that the Bible can do nothing but gain from the increase of knowledge. Now, if something is false, it will not gain from the increase of knowledge. If something is false, the increase of knowledge will threaten it. Because the more data you have, the more things that are false will be shown to be false. But he said, you know, we've already discovered so far that the increase of knowledge about this period is only going to make the Bible gain in credibility, and that has been the trend for 200 years. In fact, there's an interesting article in Time Magazine back in the 70s. It was December, uh, December 30th, 1974. Time Magazine had a cover story about the Bible, and you know that Time Magazine is not a Christian uh, journal. It's uh, not even friendly toward Christianity. It's very liberal and very anti-Christian. And yet they had an article that documented all the various controversies that have been settled by further discovery about the Bible. And this is how that, that article ends. This is in Time Magazine, quote, after more than 200 years of facing the heaviest scientific guns that could be brought to bear, the Bible has survived and is perhaps the better for the siege. Even on the critics' own terms, historical fact, the scriptures seem more acceptable now than they did when the rationalists began the attack. Unquote. So here's a totally secular opinion, not, not slanted favorably toward Christianity. It says, you know, for 200 years, the most scientific 
Advanced minds have been attacking, trying to disprove the Bible. And you know what? The dust, when it settles, you see the Bible stronger than ever before. It's actually more credible now than before they started. Because, of course, more proofs have arisen of its correctness in the last 200 years. And, and they arose because people challenged them and searched them out and found out, oops, the Bible's right. Oops, again, the Bible's right. Uh-oh, it's right again here. They have not yet found anything that has disagreed with what the Bible says. Though, of course, it'd be asking too much to ask them to confirm every word in the Bible. All we can say is that most of the Bible is historical narrative, and every bit of the historical narrative that can be tested, and that can be tested against what archaeology has found and what has been discovered, says it's true. There may be some things that we can't prove, but everything that can be tested comes out positive. That means if I want to say, but I think the other things are false, well, I'm welcome to believe that. I'm, of course, believing against all the evidence available, which, again, is not a very scientific position to take, just a, a prejudiced position. Now, one thing that we have to say has proven <coughs> better than most things, that the Bible is not only accurate but inspired by God, is the presence of fulfillment of prophecy. Now, I'm not talking about last days prophecies. I'm not talking about, you know, uh, revelation coming true in our day. I personally don't think that it is. But I'm talking about the prophecies that fill the Old Testament, which predict all kinds of things. It, prophets who said they were speaking by God's Spirit predicted the fall of Assyria, when Assyria was hugely successful and, and unbeatable and the fall of Egypt, and the fall of Moab and Ammon and, and specific places, the Philistines, and Babylon, and Persia, and Greece, and Rome, and Jerusalem. These, these places have all fallen, and all of them were predicted by prophets, usually hundreds of years in advance, though sometimes within a generation. And sometimes, in the case of Jesus, he said, this generation will not pass before these things happen, talk about the fall of Jerusalem. And it did happen just 40 years after he said it. And so this is the kind of thing that you think, okay, are these guys just really great guessers? If so, then why is it that so many people of other religions who've guessed about things have, have not hit it right most of the time? And yet the Bible has literally hundreds of predictions in it, which are said to be given by prophets. And those predictions, in fact, have come true. Now, most of this, have, we can prove it from secular history. In fact, much of the fulfillment of these prophecies is not noted in the Bible. You have the prediction, but its fulfillment is not mentioned in the Bible because uh, I guess they didn't feel like they had to rub it in everyone's faces to say, see, I told you so. But secular history does. And, uh, of course, some of the most important prophecies have to do with Israel's history and, uh, and, the, and judgments on some of her enemies, like Tyre, the, the nation uh, to the north of uh, Israel. Ezekiel chapter uh, 26, for example, has an extended prophecy about how Tyre is going down. Now, this, this is predicted 300 years before Tyre was defeated by Alexander the Great. And it predicts, and these are things that don't happen very often, it predicts that Tyre would be scraped clean like the top of a rock, and that all of its debris would be thrown in the water. How many cities has that ever happened to? I mean, usually conquerors are, are content just to conquer a city and move on and conquer somebody else. At least Alexander usually was. Why waste so much manpower and energy throwing everything in the water? And there's tremendous detail given about this in Ezekiel 26. And you know what happened? Alexander the Great did do that. And as far as I know, it's the only city that that was ever done with. And the Bible said 300 years earlier that it would be done. Now, of course, the reason was that Tyre had two uh, cities. One was on the mainland, one was an island half mile out. And the island was impenetrable by any ancient navy. There's no way that a military force could attack and, and conquer that island. So whenever the city on the mainland was subject to defeat, the people would retire to the island and no, no army in the world could conquer them out there. Nebuchadnezzar had tried 
about 300 years before Alexander, Nebuchadnezzar had spent 13 years trying to conquer that island and gave up and left. Alexander, however, conquered the mainland city, and what he did to the island, he took all the rubble from the city and threw it in the water and built from the sea bottom up, you can still go there today and see it, he built this walkway out to the island made of rock and rubble from the city. He just threw it all in the water and it built up from the sea bottom up to where his soldiers could walk across and conquer the city. Exactly what Ezekiel said would happen. How did he know that? Well, he said God told him. Maybe. I don't know if any of read theories. You know, Jeremiah said that Israel was going to go into captivity in Babylon, which isn't too remarkable. That was a very good probability in his day. But he said that after 70 years, God would judge Babylon and let the Israelites come back to their nation again. That wasn't very likely. Or even if it was likely, no one could have known it except God. And sure enough, of course, that's how it turned out. Israel did go into captivity for 70 years in Babylon. And at the end of that time, Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians. In fact, it fell to a specific Persian named Cyrus. Isaiah the prophet said some interesting things about Cyrus. Now let me tell you what happened. We get this from secular history. The Bible doesn't tell us this. When Babylon fell, it was considered to be an impenetrable city, an unconquerable city. Because it, according to Herodotus, Babylon had a wall 300 feet tall around it. That's like a 30-story building around the whole city. And the wall was so thick, there was like an eight-lane highway. They could race eight chariots on top of the wall. That's a big wall. That's a lot of concrete or whatever they had to build it with. There was no ancient army that could conquer that city or break through the walls. But there was a chink in its armor, and that was that the Tigris River, uh, the Euphrates River, ran under the wall. And at, at the point where it did, there were bronze gates to prevent humans going where water could go. So the bronze gates were always shut as a defense. Now, the night that Babylon actually fell, when that's that story of Belshazzar again. We know from secular history that Cyrus the Persian dried up the river Euphrates, redirected it so that the riverbed under the wall of Babylon was dry. And somehow the gates in the riverbed were open. Secular authorities believe it was, you know, uh, collaborators within the city must have opened it for him. And that may be true, we don't know. But the gates were open and Cyrus came in and conquered the city, largely without a fight because all the generals and so forth were drunk and <laughs> celebrating their invulnerability. Now, there's an interesting prophecy given 200 years before that event by Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 44 and 45. And it's about Cyrus. It mentions him by name, by the way. This is 150 years before he's born. And it says in Isaiah 44, verse 28, that God says to Cyrus or it says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall perform all my pleasure saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. You see what happened is when Cyrus conquered Babylon, he let the Jews go back to Jerusalem to build their temple again. So that's what Isaiah is saying Cyrus will do. Verse, uh, chapter five, 45, verse one. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him to loose the armor of kings, to open the doors before him, the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. Now, the reason Cyrus conquered Babylon is because the gates in the riverbed were not shut. How did Isaiah the prophet know 200 years before that event that those gates would not be shut on that particular day? And that Cyrus, who was not yet born when Isaiah wrote, would do these things? Well, he said it's from the Lord. Unless I was very prejudiced against all such possibilities, I'd have to say that's the best explanation of how he would know. And there's many others. Of course, there's a lot of prophecies about the Messiah, that he'd be of the tribe of Judah, that he'd be the seed of David, that he'd be born in Bethlehem, that he'd have a forerunner go before him, that he'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, that he'd be actually be crucified. That prediction was made a thousand years before the Romans came to power. And the Romans were the ones who crucified people. And, and, uh, and that he'd uh, rise again and that he'd reign. Now, those are all predictions that the Old Testament makes. I don't have time to look at all of them with you. They're in the notes I mentioned, if you want to get those notes from online. But those, those prophecies exist. 
the most recent of them was uttered 400 years before Christ. The most ancient goes back as far as 2,000 years before Christ. And some of them go back to 1,000 years before Christ. Now, these are the prophets who were giving again and again details about how the Messiah would be and what he would do. And uh, when Jesus came, he did it. Now, some people say, well, that's not too hard. Jesus knew the prophecies. He could easily fulfill those prophecies if he wanted to because he was knowledgeable. He could just arrange it. Really? When's the last time you met somebody who arranged where they would be born? Or when they would be born? Because Daniel 9 said when he would be born too. Uh, How many people could arrange to be sure that they would be crucified? Now you see, the Romans crucified people, the Jews didn't. The Jews stoned people. Jesus made the Jews angry on purpose, but he never made the Romans angry. He never did anything to get the Romans angry, and without them being angry, he'd never be crucified. He never worked on that. In fact, the truth is, he never tried to convince anyone that he was the Messiah. That's the interesting thing. He fulfilled the prophecies without ever saying that he was the Messiah publicly. Jesus never made a public statement that he was the Messiah. He did on on a few private occasions. He told that to the woman at the well when he was alone with her. He told it to his disciples alone in Caesarea Philippi. He confessed it when he was put under oath on trial in the Sanhedrin. All three times he did admit he's the Messiah, but publicly he never declared it. Jesus didn't live like a man who's trying to convince people that he's the Messiah because he knew what the Jews thought the Messiah was supposed to do, and he didn't do it. He didn't even try to do it. He knew that the Jews wanted the Messiah to come and bring a military expedition against the Romans. Jesus had opportunity to do that, but he, he, he didn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He wasn't interested in that. Jesus did not organize his life in a way to fulfill the Jews' expectations of the Messiah, unlike all the false messiahs before him who had tried to do those things because they claimed to be the Messiah. Jesus didn't even claim he was the Messiah publicly. He was not trying to fool people into thinking he was the Messiah. He just lived his life and died his death and rose his resurrection. And it just happened to fulfill prophecies that very few people were even thinking about at the time. And these prophecies are not prophecies that very many people would fulfill. And certainly if you add them all up, even less so. If I have 10 pennies in my pocket, I take a magic marker and put a a black mark on one penny and then all pennies are in my pocket. If I say, I'm gonna pull one penny at random out of my pocket, and it's gonna have the mark on it, what are the chances I'm gonna get that penny? One in 10. 10. Now, suppose I tell you in advance, I'm gonna do this twice. I'm gonna pull out the penny, it'll be the mark penny, I'm gonna put it back, I'm gonna pull out, and it'll be the mark penny again. What's the chance that'll happen twice? One in 100. How about if I say three times? That's one in 1,000. You see, Every time you add a prophecy, you have to compound the probabilities against it. And what are the probabilities anyone would be born of the tribe of Judah? Well, lots of people were, but most people certainly aren't. The chances against any particular person being of the tribe of Judah is probably probably a chance of one in a million. There's so many other places to be descended from rather than Judah. Now, of the people who are descended from Judah, how how many were descended from David? Only a very small number. That narrows it down. How many of those who are descended from David were born in Bethlehem? A much smaller number still. Of those who had all those three qualifications, how many of them had a forerunner go before them, like John the Baptist? Uh, As far as I know, Jesus is the only one, so that's one chance in thousands, probably, or millions. And how many of those people were betrayed for 30 pieces of silver by a friend? That doesn't happen to very many people. And of all those, how many were crucified? You know, all these things were predicted. Every time you add another prophecy, even if it's something that maybe someone else could fulfill this prophecy, the chances get slimmer and slimmer that anyone would fulfill two or three or four or five. Jesus fulfilled dozens. Some say he fulfilled 300. I'm willing to be uh, more skeptical about that and say I can name probably 30 or 40 for sure that he fulfilled. But let's just go with eight, because this is something that has been quantified by actually some computer studies that were done back in the 60s, I think it was, at, uh, I think it was at Santa Barbara City College, if I'm not mistaken. Some people took eight prophecies from the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled 
and tried to calculate the odds that any one of them would be fulfilled by anyone who's ever lived. And they came up with their figures. They tried to be very conservative because they weren't trying to stack the deck. They really wanted to know. They, they came up with conservative estimates. You know, only may, maybe one person in a million is from David's line. You know, maybe one in 10 million, who knows? But they were conservative in their choices. And then they worked out the compound probabilities and they said, you know, for one man to fulfill just these eight prophecies that they considered, the chances would be 1 in 10 to the 17th power. Now, that'd be, of course, a 1 with 17 zeros after it. Now, that's such a large number, you can't conceptualize it. But maybe you can, if you can picture the state of Texas covered four feet deep with silver dollars. That would be about that number. 10 to the 17th power silver dollars would cover the state of Texas four feet deep. Now, just play with me in your mind a little bit here. Suppose you had the state of Texas covered with silver dollars four feet deep, and you can mark one of those with a magic marker and have somebody dispose of it somewhere, anywhere in the state of Texas, on the surface or below the surface, anywhere, it doesn't matter. Then the experiment is have somebody walk around blindfolded through Texas and randomly at some moment reach down and pick up any random silver dollar. The chance that that person would pick up the marked silver dollar is one chance in 10 to the 17th power, which is what they calculated the chance of one man fulfilling just those eight prophecies that Jesus is known to have fulfilled, historically known. And, and we, you don't need to go further. They did. They went on and tried 40 prophecies, and it got really crazy, you know. They said that number, there's not enough electrons in the universe to, to uh, you know, test that one. But the truth is, you wouldn't place any bets on that guy getting the right silver dollar if it was a televised test. They were taking bets. Who wants to bet he's going to pick the right silver dollar in those conditions? No one would put a penny on it. And yet, people bet their whole lives against the same odds by suggesting, I don't think Jesus is the Son of God or the Messiah, or I don't think those prophets knew what they're talking about. You see, Jesus fulfilling those things proved two things. One is that the prophets really did have some kind of insight, superhuman insight, which is what they claimed. The other is that Jesus is the God that God predicted. Now, those are, those are facts. I mean, these are not, this is not uh, twisted you know, data. This is the facts. Now, I'm going to have to quit here without giving you all the evidence I wanted to give, but I will say this. To the Christian, one of the most important reasons we believe the Bible is true is because Jesus believed the Old Testament was true. Now, frankly... You have to be a believer in Jesus for this particular evidence to be important to you. But believing in Jesus is the only rational point you can reach from the evidence. You can always be irrational. There seems to be no end to the possible irrationality people can take. Again, the idea that someone doesn't know if they're a male or female shows how far our society has gotten from insisting on rational answers to questions. Um, and frankly, atheism is a belief system. It's a belief that there's no God. And there is no evidence for atheism. So most atheists say, well, okay, but I'm not saying there's no God. I'm just saying I don't believe there's a God. Okay, well, what would it take? What would it take to believe that the Bible is the word of God? Every test that can be put to it, as far as we know, that's a reasonable test, seems to yield the same result. So what would prevent one from believing it? Well, I think it's preference more than anything else. Because if it's true, that kind of cramps my style a little bit. And it's only people who don't mind having their style cramped because they love truth more than they love fantasies. You see, I have a book written by a non-Christian comic. He's a funny, he, he makes up funny sayings. And one of his sayings is on the cover of his book. He says, I've abandoned my search for truth. Now I'm looking for a good fantasy. And that's kind of where some people would have to say they are, if they're honest. Because if you're looking for truth, basically the evidence is the best place to look. And all the evidence points one direction. Now some might say, well, I don't think it's good enough evidence. Well, it's a lot of evidence. Maybe it's not enough for you. And what evidence do you have? For your position? None. 
If anyone can present evidence that the Bible was not inspired by God, I'd love to hear it. I've certainly talked to a lot of atheists, and they haven't really had anything substantial. And I'd be interested in knowing, believe it or not. You might think I'm prejudiced. Yeah, I'm prejudiced toward finding the truth. If the Bible's not true, I want to stop, you know, stop wasting my life believing and following and teaching it. I'd like to have known that yesterday, 50 years ago, if the Bible's not true. I'm interested in both sides. I do look at the evidence, and I can see the evidence all points one way, which is why I'm totally convinced of it, as I am. But let me just say one more thing about the Bible. This is not exactly hard evidence. This is just an, uh, uh, an observation. You know, it says in the Psalms, in Psalm 119, verse 130, it says, the entrance of your words gives light. That is God's words. When God's words are entering, enlightenment results. And Jesus said the same thing in John 8, 12. He said, I'm the light of the world. He that believes in me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. We should expect, if this is true, that those societies that actually follow the word of God the most would be the ones that exhibit the most enlightened values, the most enlightened culture, the most enlightened lifestyles. And what do we find? Well, we've seen what atheist societies produce. You've got one going on in North Korea right now. You've had them in Soviet Union. You've had them in China for many years. These societies, at least by people who've known any other kind of society and go there, are not seen as really paragons of enlightenment. It's more like totalitarianism. It's more like fascism. It's more like silence all opposition, kill your opponents, and so forth. Shut up and, or, or, or agree. This is the way that fascism works, and it, there hasn't yet been, a, uh, as far as we know, a society set up on atheistic principles that hasn't proven to be that way. There's been a lot of them. The Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, certainly North Korea, Cuba, China, under Mao, and to, to a certain extent right now, as we see in the news today with Hong Kong's revolts. Uh, certainly the Soviet Union, when it was around, all these societies established on, on uh, basically atheism. And someone say, no, that's not based on atheism, it's based on something else. Well, then why did they try to stamp out all religion? And why do they forbid people to believe in God or say they believe in God? It's established on atheism. Yeah, their politics are based on that too. Now, they're not really enlightened societies, in my opinion. Islamic society, not so much either. The treatment of women, you know, uh, honor killings of your own children, this doesn't strike me as the most enlightened kind of society. <clears throat> you know, jihad. Um, what about Hindu society? Yeah, it wasn't until the Christian missionaries got there that they actually stopped binding the feet of their little girls and crippling them for life and requiring widows to die on the funeral pyre with their, with their dead husband who, when he's burned. This is a society that... I don't think this is the society anyone here would, would really want to live in, at least if you're a woman. But what about societies that have been influenced by Christianity? That's where, that's where slavery has been abolished. That's where women have been exalted to equality with men. That's where care for the poor and the sick has been uh, established. By the way, you can see a very good conflict uh, between the Christian worldview and the Hindu worldview by looking at Calcutta before and after Mother Teresa arrived there. Before Mother Teresa came, lepers and sick and, and terribly poor people were left in the gutter and no one helped them. Why? Because the worldview of the Hindus is that there's reincarnation and karma. And if you're suffering like that, you had a lot of bad karma in your last lifetime. And you have to kind of get that out of the system. You have to go through it so you don't have to come back and go through it again. If somebody relieves you of your suffering now, you'll just have to come back and go through it next time around. That's the Hindu philosophy. Mother Teresa had a Christian philosophy. She said, no, help the poor. And she, she, she shone a tremendous light in Calcutta and around the world, by the way. And she was not the kind of Christian that I am. She was a Roman Catholic Christian, but that still, she had a biblical worldview. And whenever the biblical worldview is seen in contrast to others, 
society changed. Let me give you some quotes here. Paul Meyer is the professor of ancient history in Western Michigan University. He made this statement, quote, following biblical teachings, Western society halted infanticide, enhanced human life, emancipated women, abolished slavery, inspired charities of relief and relief organizations, created hospitals, established orphanages, advanced science, instilled concepts of political and social and economic freedom, fostered justice, and provided the greatest single source of inspiration for magnificent achievements in art, architecture, music, and literature that we treasure to this present day. No religion, philosophy, teaching, nation, movement, whatever, has so changed the world for the better as Christianity has done." Unquote. Now that's the professor of ancient history at Western Michigan University. And he's simply saying what's objectively true. You don't have to be a Christian to see this. All you have to do is know history, know the influence that Christy has had. Let me read you this story. This comes from a, uh, this comes from the Reader's Digest, actually. Some years ago, Reader's Digest ran a story called Shimabuku, the village that lives by the Bible. It's interesting. When American troops liberated Okinawa toward the end of World War II, they found it in an appalling social and moral condition. Then they reached the village of Shimabuku, where they were greeted by two old men, one of them carrying a Bible. Suspicious of a trap, they entered the village very cautiously, only to find it spotlessly clean, its fields tilled and fertile, and everything a model of neatness and cleanliness in stark contrast to all the other villages round about. The reason? Thirty years earlier, an American missionary on his way to Japan called at Shimabuku. He only stayed long enough to make those two converts, those two old men, to teach them some hymns, to leave them a Japanese translation of the Bible, and to urge them to live by it. With no other Christian contact, and guided only by the Bible, those two old men had transformed their community. There was no jail, no brothel, no drunkenness, no divorce. Instead, the people lived healthy, happy, fulfilled lives, an oasis of love and purity in a desert of degradation all around them. Clarence Hall, the war correspondent who wrote this story, summed up his feelings in the words of his dumbfounded driver, who said, maybe we're using the wrong kind of weapons to change the world. I have one other, uh, two other quotes real quickly here. There's a book called What's So Great About the Bible? And in it, it tells this story. It says, Dur during World War II, on a remote island in the Pacific, an American serviceman encountered a literate native from a tribe of former cannibals who was carrying a Bible. Gesturing to the man's Bible, the American said, we educated people no longer put much faith in that book. The native replied, well, it's good that we do, or else you would be eaten by my people today. <laughs> yeah, anyone who says the Bible hasn't improved culture simply is not paying any attention to history. And I want to close with this quote from Dennis Prager. Many of you know who Dennis Prager is. He's a Jew. He's not Christian. He's conservative. But I was listening to his radio program uh, a few days ago, actually, about a month ago. And he, this is a close paraphrase of what he said. He said, when I see what the Bible, I'm excuse me. He says, when I see what belief in the Bible has done for civilization and what becomes of a society that loses its respect for the Bible, it makes me believe it's true. If you remove a pillar from a building and the building collapses, you know that pillar was essential to the whole thing. And what he's saying, of course, is that belief in the Judeo-Christian revelation in the Bible has been the pillar of Western civilization, which has blessed many, many people. I realize, you know, multiculturalism suggests, oh, you're, you're being too prejudiced, thinking that white European culture is superior to other cultures. Well, go and live in one of those other cultures and see. I'm not talking about white European culture, I'm talking about biblical culture. 
It's true whether it's in Japan, whether it's in Korea, it's, it doesn't matter where the Bible ex exercises influence. It changes the culture for the good. Why? Well, if it is the word of God as it claims to be, this would be kind of what we'd hope to see as a result of people finally following God's word. The entrance of his word brings light. And certainly those cultures that have followed the Bible best, and none have, none have followed it perfectly, but those who followed it best have seen blessing and benefit to the society that others have not. Once again, that's not exactly hard evidence that the Bible's true, although it's pragmatic evidence that those who believe it's true have been very fortunate to live in societies that also believe that. When it comes down to the real evidence, the evidence is all hard, hard facts. The archaeology, the fulfilled prophecy, these are things really that are hard evidence. And for these reasons, and that's not all, but I don't have time for more. Uh, I believe we have every reason, to, if we're rational people, to see the Bible as the reliable record of what God has given us to change our lives and to give us the ability to uh, know him who is revealed in all of his pages. So that would be as far as I want to go with my lecture. And uh, we'll take questions and answers. But I'm going to give you another t chance to stand up for about five minutes if you want to. And we can regather. And anyone has questions about this subject, I'd be glad to talk to you about it. Also, if you guys don't want to answer any questions, uh, I'll ask uh, Brother Steve any questions out loud. You can write it down and hand it to him, and he can read the question and then answer it that way. I'll leave the paper.